Hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of CelebWorks Live, where Dr. Mindbender is our favorite mixologist. I'm Christopher Arsaga. I'm Neri Lemus. Thanks for joining us. And before we bring on our special guests, we want to remind you that you can automatically be entered to win an autograph 8x10 from Wally Wingert, the voice actor. All you have to do is share this live stream, and we will contact the winner after the show ends. I'm excited to bring on a duo known for their wizardry to the program, but before I bring them on, let's introduce them. Scott Zillner is a world-renowned toy collector and the owner and founder of Toy Wizards. He grew up in the 1980s, the undisputed greatest decade ever. He truly believes in collecting and what his once hobby is now his lifestyle. A new world, a new world renaissance man, he is a professional artist, toy expert, and convention promoter. He collects massive amounts of toys, games, and art. He also runs several pop culture conventions such as Power Morphicon, Robo Toy Fest, SAC Toy Con, Pasadena Comic Con, Japan World Heroes, and several others. As a professional artist, he worked on the Disney's 2010 Tron Legacy film, painting the light bikes and toys in Young Flynn's room. The same year, his Tron, uh, his Tron Stitch collectible vinyl sculpture from Disney was released. He has worked as a toy prototype painter for just about every major toy company in the business for over a decade now. And his lovely business partner, Lauren Stone, is the editor and chief of Toy Wizards and has dedicated her life to the world of nerd. She's most excited by collecting toys, writing about them, and infiltrating the convention scene. Lauren is also the writer of Sci-Fi Wire's important toy news column, as well as the site owner and executive editor of Toy Wizard's sister site, poplurker.com. Her writing has been published on other pop culture websites such as Cracked, Load Screen, Nerdbot, The Hashtag Show, and Temple of Geek. She's also a show promoter owning shows like ToonCon, Ventura Toy and Comic Expo, Simi Valley Toy and Comic Fest, and several others. She's also involved in the convention community working on a huge host of shows including Long Beach Comic Con and Power Morphicon. We are proud to personally know them both and proud to call them both friends inside and outside the business. Please welcome Scott Zillner and Lauren Stone to the program. Yay. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, guys. Thanks for joining Hi. us today. Well, hello. That was a, quite an intro. I think you forgot a couple little lines of work I've done. but I'll Well, hit it. Let's hear it. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you forgot to say that I'm a toy painter and prototyper for over a decade. Oh, I think I'd said that. You said I, I worked with toys, but I wasn't a veteran. Like a, ten years as a veteran. So oh, okay, see, so you, you've only been working for over a decade, right? Two stars and, for <laughs> and Lauren, you're okay with your intro? I thought I did a decent job. Well, the editor in chief is going to edit. <laughs> your, I got it. Your uh, your your uh, presentation, but no, man, that was cool. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, I thanks you know for thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks for having us. Hey, guys, we're, we hope you're okay with taking some questions. Also, to the general public, if you have any questions uh, for the Toy Wizards team or us, please post them on the official stream, and we will answer them if we can or if we want to. <laughs> um, so, Toy Wizards. Yes. we gotta, we got we to gotta start off with the obvious question. And now, since I've been to your house, Scott, I, <laughs> know this. I know the answer to this question, but a lot of people probably don't out there who are watching – but this question is for both of you. What do you guys collect? And, uh, you know, tell us about, like, what you collect and what you have and what you're proud of. Go for it, Scott. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I collect everything. Like, seriously, I collect, like, from Army Men to G.I. Joe's to Star Wars to arcade cabinets to props, uh, books, comics. I mean, if it's pop culture and cool, I probably have something of it in my house. It's, I, it, there's, it's really, it is difficult to put into words how much stuff I have and how many different toy lines or, you know, trash keys that I might collect. Do you have anything that's like a favorite though? Like, is there something where you're like, this is my absolute favorite? You know, since since I was a kid, I've like two main things I've collected over the years has been G.I. Joe and comic books. And those are two of my bigger things that I collect are G.I. Joe and comic books. 
That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. Lauren? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you have a anything that you collect that's a favorite or no it's all a farce i don't collect toys it's all for followers and attention i gotta go no um the uh. true <laughs> no, i i have um similarly but with the completely different stuff i collect a little bit of everything and i always have i think i remember my earliest collections being mermaids and i still collect mermaid stuff so now so before it would be like little tiny vinyl toys which now go on my desk and you know today it's like you know huge uh you know, statues. And so I've always done mermaids and robots, mermaids and robots. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I love, I love robots of all kinds. I try to have at least something from a host of different, di um, like Japanese robot things, American robots, classic ones from like the fifties, like lost in space type of, you know, era to Japanese mech, obviously eighties, nineties, megazords, um, Gundam. I have a little bit of everything. Wow. That's that's cool. pretty cool. That's pretty great. Uh, you guys both have a really strong presence online. Has your site been affected with the uh, the COVID-19 epidemic that's happening? I, I would say we're doing better than ever, actually, because people are home. And uh, therefore, they're, they're reading articles more. They're following us more when we do live uh, stints. Um, I think all around uh, we're just doing better because people have a little bit more free time at the house to to browse online and to read stuff rather than just work. It's true. Um, and then, yeah, piggybacking off of that, it's like the only thing that's changed, we're still producing content every weekday at least and on the weekends when there's something interesting or new to announce. The only difference, and this is so logistical is um how we share content is affected because of the algorithms and because mm, there's more yes. actual news coming out because of COVID-19 and restrictions and you know politics everything like everything in the machine how we share um the toy wizards articles has changed a little bit but the content on the site and the content we are producing as collectors and people with visible platforms that's exactly the same it's funny that you mentioned that we are, we're actually dealing with the same thing. A lot of our audience members are commenting that they don't, they can't receive the same access to our, our content that then, uh, they, they had previously. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one of those things you have to tackle. And, uh, I mean, we're all going to do that. And Scott, you have a really strong online business presence. Now has your business been affected? I mean, you are a well world renowned toy seller also. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, we certainly, I've certainly taken a hit because I'm not selling toys at conventions. Like that's okay. completely gone. That, and that was a majority of my, my income is going to conventions and selling toys. Um, now that since we've been in quarantine for a while, I've really worked on my, my online store, Planet X Toys, and, and you know, really sharing those links, getting those out there. And people have been going to the store and buying stuff. So that's actually helped out. So that's actually been better numbers than normal because I normally just do all of my attention towards the conventions every weekend. And now I'm spending all week trying to get stuff put online for more online sales. What do you, what do you think, what do both of you think as far as like the convention, you know, arena goes what do you think the state of the industry is going to be like in the next you know until the end of the year i mean do you have any thoughts on that we have a we have a couple shows that are still on the fence um in september we have megabit which was supposed to be our first year for a game expo in simi valley oh wow and um that's still we haven't wrote it off yet like if things change by september we can still have a small show. Mm -hmm. um, however, something like Power Morphicon, that's a huge show, right. that's already been postponed till next year. There's just no way a big show could happen this year. I just don't think, it, even, if, even if suddenly things were lifted, I still think fear will keep people in their homes rather than go out. Now, now say the end of the year, we have another show, TuneCon, and uh, we've moved Robo Toy Fest to December. If we're allowed to have smaller event shows, because those aren't 
thousands of people, those are like a thousand people. I think those would do actually rather well. Right. Um, it really just kind of depends on on how things change and us being constantly aware of the changes in the market and the changes of the attitude of people. They really want to get out. So if we could have an event when people can get out, I think it will do really well. Mm -hmm. I, I think that you, you raised a really good point and I'd like to touch on it. Um, you guys both have shows uh, that are of the smaller range. Now you have both have larger shows, but you have smaller shows where sort of you guys would benefit from the reopening of small events. Uh, you know, shows with anything over 5,000 people, we just don't, we can't fathom it take place in 2020. So, but I mean, you, even today would have been a Ventura show. Yeah, today's actually when my yeah. uh, Ventura uh, Touring right. Comic Expo was supposed to be. We had numerous clients at that show. So yeah. we are, you know, thank God we have Lauren and Scott joining us so we can sort of uh, feel a little bit more connected when we're losing, uh, you know, our daily lives. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I want to also go further, Scott, is that, like you said, Power Morphicon has been postponed. Yes. I mean, our, now that you're looking ahead for next year, because essentially this is going to be a problem that we're going to be dealing with next year, how are you looking into the operational procedures in terms of keeping, uh, sort of thinking ahead on what you want to do to plan that show and keeping social distancing measures and making sure people don't get sick next year? You know, that... that again that's june we're not even in june yet so it's it's more than a year away yeah we don't know what's going to happen by june this year right much next less year. june next year and we that's really actually have to, go ahead. Say, that's a point i want to actually jump on as well sorry to interrupt is just like we really can't we we're still planning these shows um where Semi like we're proceeding as though there's no issue, knowing that the issue can come up. But what I mean by that is we still need those government regulations saying, hey, is a gathering a hundred people or less? Is it a thousand people or less? Like whenever they decide what constitutes those small gatherings, we can only proceed from there knowing the history and the likely attendance of those shows. So in regard to Power Morphicon next year, June 2021, um, we still don't know what those social distancing guidelines will be and um, you know what will be implemented based on the health climate. Yeah, I, I hope mean, for all. It, it does give us uh, a year to, to plan things out. I mean, we were already planning for September. So with a little more time, I'm really, it gives me time to make sure everything's even more polished. It, it really does. And, uh, you know, to get more people involved, to, uh, you know, keep our guest outreach. And, you know, right now we're resending out contracts to, to people like you that say, hey, our show was this year. Now it's next year. So now you need all new <laughs> contracts to be signed by five different people that all have to check their calendars. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I mean, everybody's pretty clear as far as I know. <laughs> all right. I love, I love asking clients like, hey, are you doing anything? And they laugh at me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally going to the kitchen today or that day. So uh, I this actually struck me while we were talking. Um, growing up, for me, I've, I was into comic books. You just mentioned comic books. Earlier. Yeah. And I was huge into comic books. Like, I was like an insane comic book nerd when literally you and I are probably about the same age, when mm -hmm. literally nobody gave one crap about comic books. So I remember when I was in, I think it was like fourth grade or something. I remember we had this thing in, in junior high where, um, where they asked you like, Hey, what, you know, you're going to do an interview, but it's gotta be a profession that you want to, mm. you know, you want to be when you grow up. And I remember I was like, yeah, I want to own a comic book store. And everybody laughed at me and thought I was stupid. And so that leads me to my next question. When you guys, you know, were growing up, what, profession did you guys want for yourselves like was this something that you envisioned or i i mean if somebody could have ever told me that i could professionally organize and use my and like have my make money off my personality i never would have told i never would have loved, I, I would have been like well of course so how can you have ever doubted no but really um i wouldn't have believed it i always knew i wanted to 
I, again, organized. And I used to think I wanted to be a teacher. So I started, I went, when I started college, I went like a third of the way through the teaching program, maybe, and was like, no, I can't be locked in a classroom for that many hours. Um, so that this that, job is almost as rewarding as teaching. So, you, you know, this mm -hmm. is, that's perfect. I don't get paid as much too. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I knew I, I always knew I wanted to, I don't want to use the word entertain because I'm not enter that entertaining and not in like an actor sort of way. I never wanted to be an actor, but I definitely wanted to do something that would amuse people. And so between all the training I do in my various gigs um, and the pop culture writing and then using my organizational skills um, and just outgoing crazy personality into the convention industry, it's for me, it's been a surprise, but a pleasant one. How about you, Scott? I, I wanted to draw comic books. And I I ignored most of my schooling to just draw comic books in class. And I worked on that pretty hard for a little while and realized that I made more money selling toys than trying to draw comics. And I made a switch to selling toys. And... Um, you know, here we are years later and I sell toys and I run conventions for selling toys. And I, I made that happen. Um, as an artist, I did get to, I was offered some comic book gigs, but they paid so little that I turned them down. Like I was like, no, you know what? Um, that's not worth my time compared to as a professional painter what I would get paid to paint something for a company or draw a comic book cover for a company, the prices were just so crazy. Like comic book guys, they know you're gonna you want to do it because you want to do it. And because of that, they can always pay you very little until you become a big name. And so intro guys into the job are like, yeah, we want you to work all day for 60 bucks. <laughs> and I can't. Sounds like being an agent. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, exactly. I, I just couldn't do that because I'd already been made my made my way as a, as a professional artist. I already get a certain amount for a day rate, and I couldn't do that lower day rate and not make my money the way I do. So I I, I didn't get to be a comic book artist, but I have worked in the very similar careers. I've made statues of comic book characters. I've got to work designs. I got to design my own like transformer bugs. I've got to do everything I've wanted to do. I just didn't get to do that actual thing that I always thought I would do. It's funny. Yeah. because I remember over here on Van Nuys. I don't know if you remember, but growing up when we were kids that the Marvel building used to be over there. And I was like envisioned in my head like oh yeah you know because i used to draw comics too that's my my background's art and uh and i did the same thing it's funny you and i are like twins from <laughs> it's crazy like I have, she's got I a have better mustache a little bit more yeah. here just a tad but it's you know you're i'm catching up to you <laughs> <laughs> you know speaking of backgrounds uh i'll start with lauren lauren do you have a background that you want to share with uh people sort of how you got into the industry uh, yeah, yeah, I went to actually, um, when I switched my major away from teaching, I went into um, creative writing, f figuring I wanted to be a novelist. Um, after my mom died in 2015, and I got that like midlife crisis, oh, God, I'm next. I'm like, I've always wanted to write on the internet. Um, so I'm going to start submitting my work to crack.com. And they bit they pu started publishing like, maybe eight or nine of my articles. Um, and that was super cool. And then, wow. but then after that, I kind of, and no disrespect to them. Like I always say, no disrespect that they can do what they want with their website. It's a great website, but I couldn't hit the voice anymore. So I made my own publication. It was my, like a blog and I wrote on it for like six months. And then I said, I want to make this grow. So I changed the name to pop lurker. And part of what I was doing in addition to just evergreen um, kind of internet articles, editorials, listicles, kind of like man garbage people manifestos as I lovingly call them. Um, I was like, let me get into conventions for free. Cause I used, I did conventions. I used to go to conventions as a teenager. My first was Anime Expo 99. And I went to a, like not from 99 to like 06, I was pretty active. And then I just kind of dropped off. I just was like, didn't want to pay for it. Like my life was, 
going in a different direction, like whatever. And so then I said, let me try to get back into these conventions for free. I'll do convention reviews, like, ha ha, I got you, you know, totally in the, no good intention. And then my, then I, my very first venture into conventions as press, I run into that guy, <laughs> that one with the mustache. <laughs> and uh, we, we became friends. And so um, he hired me to do some writing for the websites and just like revamping of some verbiage, just, you know, typical freelance writing jobs. And here I am. <laughs> hey, that's great. That's, <laughs> like, hey, that, cool. that's a great success story. I think many people, I mean, we just kind of go with the flow and just keep swimming, just keep swimming and we find what we want to do. And you seem very passionate about what you do. Every time I see you, you're, you know, giddy about anything, any little thing you do. And then I wouldn't be so giddy. So I'm happy to um, be here, man. Um, I am. I know it sounds cheesy to say that, but I'm sincerely like, I'm happy to be alive. And um, I figure if you kind of have the fire and you're one of those people where if you choose a thing to get into, it works. Like I'm going to keep doing things. It's that easy for me. Speaking of things that work, Scott, I mean, how'd you get into the industry? I mean, it seems to be working for you. You've been doing this for what, over three decades now? So, you know, since I, you were really I, small. I, I, I was doing conventions before I could drive. Wow. Like, I was like 15 when I did my first convention. And I literally wow. had my mom like drive me to the convention. And I unloaded my comics and toys. She drove Your off. poor mother. I I said, I mean, you still bring your mom to shows. I love uh, to see you. Uh, uh, it's true. It's true. It's true. I did, the, I did the convention, called her up on a payphone, took my boxes of comics and toys to the street, and then waited to be picked up. That's so 15. awesome. Then, like, so awesome, man. <laughs> 30 years later, I'm running a convention in that same building. You know? Whoa. Was it, a, was it a trippy moment to just be standing there and going, I was here 30 some years ago. With I mean, I've done lots of conventions. I've, I've been a vendor in that same building in Sacramento for decades as a vendor. But I realized that it was 30 years ago, I was there as a vendor for my first time. And now I'm a promoter in this same building 30 years later. So that was pretty impressive. That's pretty cool, man. So it was very nice. I, I I really I really enjoyed that. So what was the what was the inspiration to start for both of you to start running cons? I mean, I know you said you were young, but I mean, what like drove you to do that? I mean, I getting yeah. in, getting into the industry at Comic Con one year, I was hunting around to get jobs. I tried getting jobs as a comic book artist, and they would just be laugh at me and throw me away or whatever. And I ran into this giant bald guy, almost as bald, yeah, uh, except he had a big mustache. And uh, he worked for a statue company, and he owned the license for Amy Brown Signature Series statues, which are like fairy statues you find in gift shops. And uh, talking to him over the weekend, and I said, oh, yeah, I paint. I paint those things. He said, oh, you do paint monsters. I'm like, of course, I lied. I lied my way into my first job. Hey, you just fake it till you make it. That's exactly, what you got. Exactly what I did. I what you got to do. I said, of course, I've done tons of paint stuff. Let me show you my portfolio. Let me talk to you. I talked to him for a couple of weeks. He was very hard to get a hold of. I just assumed nothing. And then he's like, oh, I see your stuff. Come out here and do some work for me. So I would drive down to L.A., work for him for a couple of days or weeks and then i'd drive home and then i'd take projects home and then bring them back to la and then he's like scott i need you here you just come and move i got you an apartment and i'm like okay you work for arnold schwarzenegger it, 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 yeah <laughs> yeah that's how he talked is his yeah, big scott, guy. my stuff scotty <laughs> yeah he's just like scott i need you to work i need you to paint here and i'm like all right I had an apartment in North Hollywood right there on uh, Vineland. And uh, I I was now in the industry. I was working in statues. I then started working for Jax. I then started working for Gentle Giant, which led wow. me to work for Mattel. Like I worked in, with everybody in those years. 
And, uh, you know, now I'm a name. I, 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 I'm a definite name and known for solid, quick paint work. So that's awesome. You know what? I'm glad you talked about it because I, I want people to know never feel discouraged to fake it till you make it because I wouldn't be here without that. And ask this guy <laughs> down here. Uh, you know, I convinced him, luckily enough, that I was not insane. Ha, had him fooled. And uh, here we are. We have, you know, this company that represents over 100 people. And, uh, you know, I, every day is a good day. I and, still think um, you're insane, though. So it's okay. Well, thankfully, you you found out. It only took you what a decade. So yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you have to have that drive of insanity in order to get things done, because a sane Absolutely. person yeah. would never attempt it, or a sane person wouldn't keep doing it. Yeah, with, I mean, the after only thirteen way, hours. Yeah, the only way any of these projects that I have get done is because I'm just that crazy to keep following through and fighting to make it happen. Um, my biggest show is Power Morphicon, and it is the absolute worst show to, for me to run. It is so difficult on me. I want to die sometimes, and I just push through it, and I keep fighting, and we every other year, we get this show on the road. We get it made. We get it done, and at the end of the show, people are generally happy. So that show that shows beloved and I'm going to move to Lauren and ask the same question. What was your inspiration to start running comic cons from the writing side? Oh my gosh. Um, it was basically, so after I met Scott and he hired me and I started doing some work for him, um, other shows, other promoters kind of, I guess, I don't, I guess took notice. I'll say took notice. And I was hired on. They thought you were working for me and they tried to steal you. Yeah, they wanted they wanted to get in on your secret, but um, yeah, that's I, I started getting hired by other promoters to either do a press release or process their press requests for their shows or um, coordinate volunteers or help book uh, talent. And so I quickly found from the again the logistical side that I understood the moving parts very quickly. And I was organized enough, again, not giving away my secrets, but I was just kind of organized enough to figure out how to compartmentalize the elements that make a what I consider a fleshed out show, be it a big one like Power Morphicon um, and, or a smaller one like, you know, Simi Valley Toy and Comic Fest. Um, the moving parts don't change, just how many pillars you need to keep it from collapsing is what changes. Um, so I gave it a shot. I was I just wanted to sort of see what happened. And I have Scott with me as a business partner um, to give me perspective and advise. And I bring in my ideas and he brings in his ideas. Um, I feel, I since as this might sound schlocky or cheesy, I feel like I can't fail. I can't fail. Just, I, I it, it just feels right. <laughs> You know, that leads me to my next question. What's a normal day in the life of Scott and Lauren? Like, what do you guys do? I mean, not, I mean, you, you can talk pre-coronavirus and then you can talk post-coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> Who should go first? <laughs> Scott, definitely, because yeah. then he'll, he'll, he'll in, you know. It's a, it's a everyday thing. Like, you know, from the morning, we're always messaging back okay this is on the on the docket this is on the docket what about this what about this and we try to work out solutions um just like you guys you know you have a, a plan that you need to do you divide up the work we have a plan chris <laughs> this is the first we threw it away like 10 years ago yeah, you, so you always have, everything <laughs> you always have an idea that you're trying to make and you know okay i want to build a square well a square won't work now it's got to be a triangle. Triangle won't work. All right, what about a sphere? Sphere works. Let's go. And it's that kind of chipping down at an object to make it work that makes a project get done. And from, from the start of the idea to the finished product is a lot of constant chipping away at that block until you get that one piece that is a tool that works. It's funny, I constantly feel like that idiot on an airplane that's shoving a luggage bag that's way too big into a compartment and trying to make it fit, and then somehow it fits. And that's, that's how I feel finally, in this business. You finally twisted that object in the right direction and got it to slide into that spot, and then it worked. 
And Absolutely. That's what putting on any of these projects are. It's a lot of problem solving. It's a lot of juggling. Um, it's a lot of words in, 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 and uh, showmanship and in order to get the project done. And then it works. And then once you're there, you can you, then you can sigh like, OK, finally, it's going through and everything's going right. You know what? I, it's just, I want to interject real quick because I think that I, all of us do this, the, all the people on, on here right now. When we get an idea, we don't just like keep it to ourselves. We see it and we go, hey, we can actually do this. Like we don't, we don't just not talk about it and make it come true. And I know a lot of people that are like, oh, I have this idea. And then it just like goes away. For us, we actually make stuff happen. We, that's we that's that. how we have toy wizards. Exactly. This, this was an idea I had for a couple years, but I could not make it work yeah. until I got Lauren involved. And then once Lauren jumped on board and we worked as partners on this, now that's an active you know, fully functional website. It's a full plan and every day it gets done. And that's because she, that missing piece I needed to make that tool was Lauren. Now we have Lauren, we have toy wizards. Otherwise it would have still just been one of a million ideas I've got in a file cabinet that I haven't made work. Yeah. See, Nuri's my <laughs> I said, can I have your file cabinet, Scott? <laughs> if there's an idea that I can make work with you, I will let you know. <laughs> Please let me know. I'm always up for new ideas. I don't know if you know, but I'm not that busy right now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm actually well, busier than ever like because of uh, being stuck at home and not leaving for a convention every day. That means out of seven days, I would only have like three days at home. Yeah. Now I have seven days at home. I'm actually getting even more projects done. And I mean, the same, more the same goes for Chris and I. I was only being facetious. But Lauren, I have to ask, what's <laughs> the, the same for you? What is your uh, What is your normal day in the life of you? In regard to work stuff, um, like I'm like Scott was saying, it's a lot of even it, even in quarantine, we still talk about our we talk about our 2022 calendar. Um, we spend a lot of time pitching each other potential ideas, uh, like for shows. I'd be like, hey, what do you think of this kind of show? And he's been like, what do you think of that kind of show? We talk about Toy Wizards content. We talk about what we can or cannot do to make it grow. Um, even though I came on board with Pop Lurker, I still run Pop Lurker content past Scott. I am oh, I always want his feedback. Um, you know, we talk about, and even though, you know, the show is that we had to postpone for this year, it feels like it's still a year away. There's still little bits that were chipping away, chipping away, um, just constant correspondence to trying to get those moving parts correct. On the non-work side, what does my day look like? In quarantine, I'm punching trees because I'm continuing my Krav Maga training. <laughs> <laughs> Leave Groot alone. <laughs> he needs to go. He needs to die. I got to gotta get it out. So, um, you know, I, I just, we were just talking about Scott. We were just talking about Lauren and, and Nuri being our, you know, the, the, the puzzle pieces that we needed to make these things happen. And for Nuri and I, we completely like we meshed because what he's good at, I'm not good at. And what I'm good at, he's not good at. So we work so well together. It, it, can you tell me how you and Lauren work so well together? Like, she can spell. <laughs> she can spell? <laughs> yeah. Wow. She can spell. Uh, she can write. There's a lot of those little, uh, little detail things where I might be an idea guy. So there's a lot of little extra bits I cannot accomplish. No right. wonder I never got an email pre Lauren. So that's <laughs> great. That's good to know. <laughs> um, and what we found is, you know, each of us have our own strengths and weaknesses, but together we can accomplish a lot more than we can accomplish by ourselves. Yeah. And that's where we've been able to get all these things done is because when we're working together, we can see a problem, figure out a solution, and then like, do you want to do that? Do you want to? Okay, I'm going to handle that one. You handle this one. Yeah. And, and we take care of it. Passing the flag. And it's a good thing. Yeah. I have to add, like, you guys have to put aside your egos, right? Constantly. I mean, Chris and I do that constantly where we're putting our egos away. No, our egos are right there done. in the front. I mean, that's our guiding oh, really? light is our ego. 
Oh, we're such, oh. such cocky bastards, dude. It, like, so you've never seen you, two peacocks. So we're the only ones who do that, right? We're the, <laughs> yeah, that's we're funny. <laughs> Have to put the ego away for the us. The thing is, with, with me and Scott and the way we work, is that because our strength, because at the core, we have this, a very similar headspace with work and how much work to do. And if we're not constantly brainstorming for something that'll make money or could, could, could potentially be a new brand or IP or angle, we're wasting our time. So because we're both like that, um, it makes the friendship a lot easier because we don't kind of have to explain that like, oh, I'm answering a business email right now. Give me like, No, of course I am. Of course you are. Yes, because business is always happening. Right. Um, so yeah, with that, it's, uh, it's one of those things where because our strengths are so different, we don't step on toes unless I try to do something like art or graphic related, or he tries to do something that's like really editorial and we both look at each other. <laughs> We both have like, this is a true story. Like I've tried to do something like artistic once and he was just like, why? Like this quality is no. And I'm like, I don't hate me. And then he'll try to write something really big. And I'm like, dude. And he's like, what? I tried. And so th those have been really funny conversations. That's hilarious. It's true. Speaking, speaking of funny conversations or funny stories, what's your favorite convention story? And either one of you, I mean, whenever you guys think of it, uh, you guys can jump in. I think we both made the same face. I'm like, that, that's, wow. you know, the, the problem with any of those stories is that you would have to name names. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. That's yeah. true. And naming names could, could always come back to bite you. And uh, I don't want to name names that could bite me uh, on that, on that frontier. Absolutely not. I'll say, this. Okay. I'll say this. Here's a good, here's a nice story. Um, I've, again, I've been to a bunch of conventions and in a bunch of different roles as an attendee, as staff, as press. Um, my favorite convention experience, I would say, is very, very recent. And it was uh, probably San Diego Comic-Con uh, 2019 because that was the first year we went as toy wizards and just the different vibe of like, I am a toy journalist. I am here just to talk to the the biggins and the exclusives and here's my goal at the show. And it was really, and people knew us and the site and it, that was really exciting. It's always fun. It's always cool to network or literally work, but that was a really good memory for me was when it was like, oh, Toy Wizards is a thing and people know us here. That's, that is something that's, you know, we've been working on Toy Wizards for a while now, but it is actually became a name for toy coverage and to be have that recognition you know people recognize us for uh editorial work where you know i'm not an artist on toy wizard i'm actually a toy reviewer i'm i'm writing you know and i'm not drawing and that's quite quite a different skill set for me you know it's funny that you guys both brought it up but you're right that recognition it's such a powerful moment because i remember when chris and i sort of made the cusp for that jump between that fine line of nobody knowing us at all and everybody knowing who we were. So, you know, I, not because- I, I'll remember the first time somebody walked up to me and they were like, hey, aren't you Chris Arsaga from Celebrix? And I was like, huh? <laughs> it, 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 can be a, it can be a little weird or daunting at shows, you know? And I'm not, I'm not the most social person. So if somebody walks up to me and I'm like, who are you? I'm sorry. You know, it's always a little weird, but funny. So Chris, that's where he comes in. He comes in and, you know, makes it light and social and wonderful. So, um, you it's know. Funny. I've, I don't, I'm sure, Scott, you've had this happen, but has, has anybody ever asked you for an autograph? Yeah, that happens quite a bit. Um, on the Power Ranger side, and for Power Morphicon, quite, you know, I get asked for photos and autographs. On the artist side, it's a little more rare because I'm not always at conventions as the a artist, guest, you know. Right. But there is a couple like video game shows and whatnot that I do where I'm actually an artist guest. Oh, you know, right. Because of my my work on so many toys, I've done toys for certain things. Like, oh yeah, like I worked on uh, the Star Wars Infinity stuff. I did most of the Star Wars figures for that line. You know, I, like oh wow, that's what we want you to sign. So, yeah, I, I got tripped out 
one time somebody well actually it's been a couple times but the first time really tripped me out somebody asked me and i'm like you don't want my autograph because <laughs> i'm worth anything you don't want that so uh as far as your shows go uh can you tell me like how you determine which guests you're bringing to each show is it just based solely on theme or do you get like you know the 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 old uh the old feels for a certain person when you hear about them you're like yeah i want to meet that guy let me bring him no, you know, real, realistically, for a lot of my shows, it, and it depends on the theme of the show, because we have different events and different events cater to different markets. Right. And um, the first thing I think of is like, well, is this is this something Celeb Works? Do they cover any of these guys? Can I give Can I give Neri a call? Is, like, is this something that I can take care of? And <laughs> you can always give me a call. <laughs> um, and it depends on the event. Like if we're doing a video game event, we want to get video game voice actors or video game related people. If I'm doing a toy <laughs> show, um, I want to try to get guys that are related to that toy show or, you know, at least in a theme. Um, and generally like say Robo Toy Fest is a robot show, but I've been bringing in GI Joes for that show. Right. So I have, I always have a couple GI Joe actors, then I have a couple Power Rangers, and then I try to find another robot related uh, voice or two. And that's that mix for that show. Um, for Simi Valley, where we only have a couple spots. Mm -hmm. So we chose those spots very, very specialized on who could, who could we call a favor on to come out to Simi Valley and, and to make that event happen. Um, ToonCon is is much more lore and centralized, and and she can talk about uh, how the, we decide for guests on that one. Uh, ToonCon's actually, in, from in my opinion, one of the more fun shows to book guests for because yeah. it's so specific. So that one, um, and because I'm hopeful again that year two is going to happen, but because we're in, we're we're planning year two, um, and year one went well we have people who have now heard of the show. So people that I reached out to for year one are coming to year two. Um, so it's really exciting to figure out that balance between voice actors or art talent. And that's a really cool one for cartoon art talent to shine. People, you know, at a more traditional Comic-Con, you bring a character designer from an old Nickelodeon show no one's gonna care. You do it at ToonCon and you have people freaking out. They've got to meet that artist. And I love it where ToonCon, you know, is a balance between, it's not a simply a celebrity show. It's not all voice actors, it's art talent where, and that art talent is celebrated. So that's a really cool show for us to book, not only book for, but like the panels make themselves. It's just, it's fantastic. I, yeah, I really enjoy uh, ToonCon and I'm lucky to have uh, those connections in the animation industry. And so it worked out. You know, it's so funny that you say that because you, I missed the inaugural ToonCon, right? You were you're yeah, I was at an, for us. I, I understand. I was at another show, so Chris was there, but I was so jealous because Floyd Norman and Butch Hartman were both at that event. Mm -hmm. And I'm huge fans of both of them. So, you know, it things happen. It is what yeah, it is. Butch walked over to me and said, hey, where's Nuri? No. <laughs> Get out of here. Get out of here. Um, so speaking on that note, who, is, who has been your favorite convention guest? It doesn't have to be somebody that you've had at your shows, but who have you guys seen at conventions that you're like, oh, that's that's my favorite guest. That's cool. That, I mean, like, as having him as a guest at our show or just meeting somebody? Either one. Either one. I tell you, I met um, I met the Fonz once at a show, and he was the nicest guy I've ever met. Henry, Henry cool. Winkler really is the nicest guy on the planet. Yep. Um, so as for somebody who I've met, Henry Winkler is 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 the top of my list. I told him I do all my photos with the, the Fonzie thumb. And he's like, you keep doing that. So I have the Fonz sign of approval to do this. That's pretty cool. And I'm not ripping anybody off. The Fonz said I could do it. <laughs> um, How about you, Lauren? For me, and this is, again, I not schmaltzy. I sincerely mean it. At our shows, um, anyone that I 
like I love that moment where a fan walks in and sees a guest that we've booked and literally screams. That happened at TuneCon. And that was so exciting. Um, I think for me, uh, and this is kind of funny, um, at TuneCon, again, Terry McGovern's was there, as you guys know. And he just gave me the best compliment because as I take my physical training really, really seriously. I'm like, again, I talked about Krav Maga. I'm always, I train several times a week. I take it super seriously. And he said to me, um, young lady, I don't mean to offend you, but you are buff. And I was just like, best friend. <laughs> I loved it. It's like, that's how you get to my heart. You tell me like I'm swole and I'm like. <laughs> you like Hulk out. Or... I got so excited. I was like, really? <laughs> so Scott, um, I think I know the answer to this. At least I have my own answer to this. But how do you think your show stands out against the rest? I, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like some people say, oh, you're doing all these shows. You're just trying to cash grab. And I'm like, no, I'm doing these shows because I'm passionate about it. If you're not passionate about it, that would be like, you know, those toy con guys that just dropped their shows completely and left people dry. Yeah. You know, um, I'm passionate about these events. I only run a show because I want to run that show. Right. Um, I did Robo Toy Fest for three years without admission. Wow. And I did that to grow that show. Yeah. Because it was my toy and Lego show. I made a robot convention because I wanted a robot convention. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's why I did it. And I've worked at it for years and I'm going to keep putting it out there because I love throwing that event. That's my, that's my personal dream convention. And every, every time it comes up, I'm, I'm happier and happier because more and more people come out to that show and it's become a really good event, um, not just for buying toys, but be, with the guests that we bring out to that event. Lauren, how about how about you, Lauren? What? How uh, does your how does your how do you think your show stand out against the rest? Oh, got it, got it. Um, I think <laughs> no, like, I'm like wait, what part of the, I was listening the whole time, but what part of the question are you talking about? Um, yeah. They're small. Um, some of the ones that I have, I think for my personal portfolio, um, I think TuneCon is going to be the one to like really pop first, just because I think it's a really awesome hook. And the um, the fans of, of the convention, like on social media, are very, very, very active. They're very, um, they, they love suggesting guests. Like, so the little community built around that show is super, super excited and they're fantastic people. Um, that said, when we announced the show in Simi Valley, everyone over there, they're like, oh my God, nothing like this happens over here. So while some of the shows are modest in size and um, you know, even the video game show in Simi Valley that was actually suggested by an attendee. And I said, that's a really great idea. I would love to do that. And I think this location will will help that, will help this show grow. Um, but the point I'm trying to get to is the shows that I have um, all hit the correct nails to make it a really full day of fun. So yes, they're on a smaller scale. Um, they're either hotel shows or smaller parts of the convention center, but they hit all the nails of like fantastic guests, reasonable ad admission, um, really nice programming, swag, contests. Like I feel that everything in there to make the attendee feel like they're in for a fantastic day, I think that's where they stand apart. I'm not, it's not just 10 vendors in a room and you had to pay 10 bucks and there's nothing to do, but you know, get ripped off for a broken toy and you go home. Like, no, I, I, I I'm a big believer in being self-aware and having decorum. And that's where I feel, what's what I feel that I add to my shows and Scott's that I work on with him. You only yeah, make my I'm shows gonna, better. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say, you know, I, you, you made a comment about your shows being small. I mean, Chris and I have been to larger shows and not have had as much fun as we would have at a smaller show. So yeah. and you keep in mind you, that you both failed in your answers because the correct answer was because we book exclusively through celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, you, now, of course, moving past the joke. <laughs> what are the what are words of advice that you would want to give to aspiring convention promoters everywhere? 
you really have it has to be a passion project you have to be doing that convention because you want to run that convention not because well i think i can make like a grand off of this because if you're doing that convention just to try to make a buck you're never going to succeed at it because in the end you're you're doing that show for the wrong reason you know i do these shows because i want to have a robot show i want to have a cartoon show i want to have a video game show i want to have a comic con that just isn't la comic con i want to have a show where anybody can just show up have a good time meet their heroes get a couple comic books and walk out of there smiling and saying they had a good time that's what i try to do yeah i it's funny because when we go to shows now if we go to like you mentioned lauren you mentioned san diego comic con i used to go to san diego comic con like back when it started like i remember when i was in like junior high and high school and i'd go and it was like how some of the smaller cons are and i enjoy going to the smaller cons because i don't like getting lost in the mix sure. like when i'm there i feel like sometimes i'm like dude nobody's even cares about what i'm doing or you know i could literally do whatever i want nobody cares which i like it when people actually care and acknowledge and know that we're there so you know, we love going to your guys' show. You guys, you guys are phenomenal. You guys, you seriously, you do a really good job, and we love you both so much. Um, you. So, Lauren, I have a question for you. You're yeah, an, a young adult author. You wrote a book called My Starlight. I can did. you tell us a little bit about it and where people can find it? Yes, um, it is still available right now on Amazon through Kindle um, and and in print. Uh, the rights are reverting back to me in July. So we'll see what, you know, things are going to happen with it after that. But in the meantime, you can still find it on Amazon. It's actually, it's a young adult slice of life. Um, and it hits a lot of nails, not in a pandering way, but in, in things that mean a lot to me. Um, it's about convention culture. It's about anime fandom. It's about a young girl who's bisexual, who starts out, you know, in in this relationship with a perfectly fine young dude, but then gets a crush on a girl in the anime club and like, oh no, what do I do? And so, I mean, it's just a story that a lot of people can relate to that go to our shows that are in fandom who are young and, you know, it's not a coming out story. This girl's secure. And I was hoping that would be a good influence because there's so many coming out stories. And sometimes like you don't need to start at that point in the story. You start from the interesting part. Right. So. That's what I tried to accomplish with it. That's awesome. Hey, Nuri, well, uh, before we before we get into the end, we need to go through the uh, the questions. I know. I, we're going to do that. So the first I question we have is from on there. Yeah. The first one we have is Erica Hess, who says, what was your first collector item and what got you started on collecting them? For me, it was quite like I already had Micronauts. I already had Star Wars figures. But 1979... And that Christmas of 79 going into 1980, I got a Shogun Warrior. In fact, you can oh. see them in the background here. I love Shogun Warriors, man. And that Shogun Warrior left me on the path of damnation to collecting robots. And we have Robo Toy Fest because of that guy back there. So for me, Shogun Warriors made me start collecting toys more than just playing with toys. Like I was now wanting where's the other robots how can i get more of these robots there's a comic book about these robots i need to know more and i never stopped wanting more after that point how about you lauren how what was your first toy my first toy um god i'm trying to think because i remember when i was a teenager i went through this huge like anime collecting thing but um because things were more scarce back then like i had just posters floor to ceiling in my room, I had uh, VHS tape, bootleg VHS tapes just all over my room. Um, I think, but you know, again, I was kind of a kind of a trash collector, just all sorts of just collect little knickknacks and stuff. Um, I started taking my collecting more seriously. I want to say 2007, and that's when I got I got a vintage um, Green Ranger Dragon Dagger, mm. and from there, I was like, here we go. So. <laughs> Nuri, what what about you? Me? You know, it's funny. I I, I was never much, I guess I, I was more of a toy car collector. I liked collecting vintage cars. Actually, if you see it in the background, there's a Vans Volkswagen toy that I have right here. 
And that's kind of how I got started in uh, toys. How well, about you, about, Chris? What about collecting in general? I mean, what's your? What I you mean, I remember, I remember comic books really at an early age, and I it wasn't. I was very into you know trading cards and comic books, but it was always of the entertainment field. It was never sports cards. It was never like the superhero. It was always like you know the Little Mermaid comic book or you know certain things like that. It was always entertainment based. Yeah. I, I will never forget, and excuse me for, uh, you have to, I have to apologize ahead of time for the long-winded answer on this one, but I always will remember this, and I think Scott will probably appreciate this. There, there was this uh, TV show called Amazing Stories. <laughs> and the Mark Hamill episode. Thank you. It was called Gather Ye Acorns, and I remember seeing that as a kid, and my mom, God bless her, I love my mother all to, you know, to death. She's amazing. Um she actually, as a child, collected baseball cards and comic books. And I came across her stuff as a kid. And I had already started kind of collecting comic books because I always loved Batman. And I will always remember watching that episode and just being inspired to, like, just put everything away. Because that was the message of the episode was everything that you, when you're a kid, everything you hold dear, keep it and keep it perfect and keep it in good shape. And when you get older, you'll be richer than any, any doctor or lawyer that you know. And it's and it's absolutely true because in the episode, he has like, you know, Action Comics number one and he's got all kinds of crazy stuff. So I started putting my stuff away when I was early. I mean, I still have so much stuff from when I was a kid. I mean, I, there was, I had to sacrifice a lot as most people did when, you know, you grow up and you move out. I had to unfortunately sell my entire comic book collection, which stabbed me in the heart. It hurts. But I, I built most of it back up now. So, but yeah, that's that was for me. That was basically it. But you know, if in that episode he didn't sell it then and had kept it till now, and <laughs> if he was a millionaire, he would be a billionaire. That's right. <laughs> it's funny because even further for me, which is even funnier, is that uh, do you remember his name, his character's name in the episode? I don't. His, I'm a big, huge LA Kings fan. I'm a big, like, Los Angeles sports fan in general. His name in the episode is Jonathan Quick. Mm. And the goalie for the LA Kings is Jonathan Quick, it's which Jonathan is my Quick. favorite player right now, which is really funny for me. I'm, I, I, think, uh, I think it's fundamental that people out there know that, hey, it's not weird. You, you should collect something, and there's always a starting point to anything. Um, Saki the Sock Puppet wants to know, what's – What's it like creating toy wizards and why? Um, I wanted to have a, a toy news website. I wanted to talk about toys. And uh, when Lauren came on board, we were able to make that happen. And not only make it happen, but it's the, the number three toy site in the world. So we're doing great. That's amazing. Uh, Andrew West says, is pr a promoter different than a manager or a boss of a convention or show? And I mean, I think Lauren can answer that because she knows different tiers of people working within a con. Uh, typically, the promoter's the owner, from my experience. It's uh, the verbiage for the person who owns the show and pushes for people to get on board. Um, every show would benefit from having a manager, or what I call Lauren with a clipboard, uh, floor manager. I think that's what's missing from a lot of shows that I see, depend, regardless of the size, you go, and, I, and I, I don't mean this condescendingly, but it's like there's no grown-ups on the floor. You just need somebody who looks accountable and professional to be like, there. this is clearly show staff, not hotel or convention center staff. And I just think it, that, that benefits. And again, that's a manager to me. And that's honestly, that's something that, that's very important too. I mean, any, any promoters out there that really want to run a smooth show, for Nuri and I, I mean, having somebody like you, Lauren, out there to like, you know, that we, you know, we know like, hey, that's Lauren. If something we need, we need to talk to her. That's so invaluable. Like, seriously, and it helps us with our job. And I appreciate it's that. essential. The, the promoter themselves, he or she, the promoter is busy, you know, as, as Scott put it, what is it? Shaking hands, kissing babies? The it's, it's <laughs> kissing hands and shaking babies. Yeah, I was right. just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to do that kind of work as the promoter. But that's why she's here as the manager to take care of any other issues while I'm shaking babies and kissing hands. Yes. Uh, I, there's one last question we have, and uh, it's Cliff Galbraith at East Coast Comic Con <laughs> basically saying, what is Neri not good at? And I've got a response for that. It's finding the cure to the coronavirus. That is something I'm not good at. 
So it, that, um, it, is this like clearing the floor for me to like have a platform, like a soapbox time? Because I can tell you what he's not good at. <laughs> <laughs> and we're we're going to move on from what That's Chris wants to say. I love Nuri. He's so awesome. Scott, he does so Scott. Job. So Scott, Lauren, can you tell people where they can find you? Things to follow, things to plug. Go ahead, Lauren. All right. Well, you can find um, me on my social media. Um, I'm Lauren Stone at um, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Feel free to follow me. Um, all of our outlets, Toy Wizards, that's toy-wizards.com, poplurker.com. You can find my column on Sci-Fi Wire um, Weekly, Important Toy News. Um, and uh, gosh, oh, and I'm also writing guest blog spots at my um, Krav Maga studio. So Citadel, Krav Maga.com. How about you, Scott? Um, let's see. I'm Scott Zilder on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which I never use. I hate Twitter. Uh, it's just yelling at people. Um, <laughs> it's, just yelling. it's just yelling. Twitter's just yelling. <laughs> like, I have an opinion. Listen to me. That's all Twitter is. Um, That's me every day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> then the, all the conventions have their own websites. Uh, Robo Toy Fest, Pasadena Comic Con, Simi Valley, uh, Megabit, ToonCon, uh, Power Morphicon, Japan World Heroes, Sack Toy Con. And then my, my web store to buy toys, Planet X Toys. Please keep this roof over my head. That's it. <laughs> Go check out those links, guys. And we want to thank you both for coming on the program. You guys were phenomenal, terrific. Thanks. And uh, we are approaching the end of our show. But before we take off, Chris wants to tell you a few things. Yes, I do. All right, Chris. <laughs> our next show will return on next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. We want to announce our special guest for next week's program. It is Michael Gray, Billy Batson in the original Shazam. And for anybody who wants to catch up on the original Shazam during the week, you can actually go on DC Universe and watch it. Nuri and I both have it, and we've been watching it. We love that show tremendously. It's amazing. Uh, also, we want to remind you to tune in to our weekly special series on Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific. It's called Yojo Raps. Uh, this week's special guest is the love of my life, Morgan Lofting, the Baroness. Uh, so, anyways, Thanks again for joining us, guys. And my name is Chris Arsaga, and you can follow me at The Real Arsaga. And this has been Nary Lemus, uh, leaving you with, and you can follow me at The Real Nary Lemus on Instagram. Just leaving you with a small reminder keep your feet on the ground, always reach for the stars, and never forget to stay inspired. Night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night.